And we just walked James and Thomas down to go to school. And so now I'm an amalgam of Toy Story characters. Here we have Woody's hat. Yeah, yeah. Thomas is Woody and he hates his costume. He despises his costume. He screamed and yelled when we put on his costume. Why? I guess he'd rather be a spaceman than a cowboy. So there goes Woody. Um, and then I am Forky because it seemed like a t-shirt would be a nice, easy thing to do. Just realize my microphone's in the wrong spot. That's what happens when you run downstairs, try to take care of a million things at once. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. Hope you enjoy your Halloween time. Oh, we have a Halloween sale going on, by the way. Check it out. PokerCoaching.com slash Halloween. Might as well go get a discount on PokerCoaching.com. You can get access to literally everything I make and a lot of content from my hand-selected world-class coaches. You can get everything. Two bucks a day. Two dollars per day. Um, yesterday, we actually had three webinars. We had a webinar on Mindset by Evan Jarvis. We had a webinar by James Romero going through various player pool tendencies, high stakes strategies uh, by reviewing the um, very, very high stakes games that have been taking place on GG. That was, that was great. He always does a really good job of breaking down the data of like how much you can be betting in these specific scenarios, how many bluffs you can have in your range, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we also had a webinar, well, it was a, a live stream by Faraz Jaka. He streamed for quite a few hours for the Poker Coaching members. So make sure you are checking that out. Good morning from Hurricane Stricken New Orleans. Oh, be careful. Be careful there. Hurricanes in New Orleans don't go so well. Do you all know that New Orleans, I believe it is below sea level, which is a problem when it rains, right? Because, well, normally water goes out to sea when it rains. It, it trickles down into the ocean. But if you're below sea level, the water trickles in. It's a bit of a problem. Um, so be careful. Be careful. Take care of yourself. I love New Orleans. That was actually my last trip right before COVID happened. One of my friends had a bachelor party there. And oh my goodness, it was a heck of a time. <laughs> it was a heck of a time. Lots of good memories from that. Um, today, we're going to be discussing the idea that you do not know everything. A lot of people think they know a lot, and even if they don't, they want to do everything in their power to sound smart and stroke their ego and disprove other people who they view to be smart. And you have to realize that if you want to succeed at life, your goal is not to try to make yourself seem like you're a know-it-all. The goal is to instead learn, progress, move forward, and realize some things you can definitively know, some things you cannot. And it turns out you can't really definitively know a whole lot. Whenever people come to me with poker hands to discuss, very often they'll say things like, I knew the guy was bluffing, so I called. But like, you don't know the guy's bluffing. You wanna say hello real quick? You wanna say hello? Oh, look, yeah, you're on the show. You're out of your Woody costume. Here, let's put on your hat. Let's put on your hat. Yeah. Oh, you don't want the hat? Why not? You love Woody. Here, put on your Woody hat. Yeah, Woody hat. You don't want Woody hat? Okay. Can you say hello to everybody? Hello. Are you having a great day? Yeah. He's such a happy boy. He's such a happy boy. Except for when he's wearing his Woody clothes. Can you say good luck? Good luck. Good luck. All right, you going to go with Mommy? No. Yeah, okay, here. Here, wear your Woody hat and go with Mom. Okay, bye. I'll see you later. Say say bye bye. You blow a kiss. There you go. There you go, deputy. No. <laughs> All right. See you. Bye bye. <sighs> okay. 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 Go on. Oh goodness. He knows he is the boss, indeed. Avoid the trap of having to say something rather than having something to say. Indeed. LOL, they never cooperate. Well, James wanted to be Buzz Lightyear. He has a Buzz Lightyear costume. We presume Thomas wanted to be Woody because he has a Woody toy. He runs around saying, Woody, Woody, Woody. 
And he always wants you to put the hat back on Woody. I put that hat back on Woody a thousand times by now. But for some reason, he does not want to be Woody. Which makes sense. You don't want to take somebody else's life, right? You don't want to do that. So recognize that whenever you are doing most things in life, you lack information. And the gambling world is interesting because sometimes you have complete information, such as when you're playing roulette or craps, right? And sometimes you have less information or no information or incorrect information, right? Like, let's say you go to play a poker game and someone you trust 100% tells you this game's super soft, very legit, etc. You go there, you wire a bunch of money, you sit down to play, and you immediately realize, oh my god, I'm being cheated here. <laughs> well, what does that mean? That means that what you thought was not true. Maybe you play all day, and then finally at the end of the session, you realize, oh my god, I've been cheating. Or maybe I've been cheated. Or maybe you've been playing for a year, and you realize, man, I just, why am I losing at this game, beating every other game pretty hard? Well, you start to figure out, try to figure out why, right? And um, it's important to understand that you do not know what is going on in most scenarios. So you have to use your best judgment. And judgment is something that is hard to develop, but over time, if you surround yourself with good people who seem to be doing well, well, who are doing well, you figure out what they are doing that allows them to do well, make sure it's not just variance, right? Poker's a tough game because you can surround yourself by people who have just been smacked in the face with a deck, right? And then you don't learn anything. Um, but surround yourself with good people and you will, like their good judgment, that has allowed them to succeed will rub off on you to some extent. So let's say, let's go through poker, gambling, etc., and talk about the idea of, of you do not know everything and what you can do about it. So opponent's range, right? Very often people try to narrow their opponent's range, as you should, but they narrow it way too much. They think that by the end of the hand they will definitively know what their opponent has. And if they don't, they think it means they screwed up. But in reality, you're very rarely going to know what your opponent has. You're going to think they have a range. I was actually showing off poker coaching yesterday in a YouTube video, and I was going through a homework question, and someone said, like, how can you play if you don't know what your opponent has by the river? And the answer is, you have to play according to whatever their range is based on how you reasonably narrow it. And if you can't reasonably narrow their range, it's okay. You just have to make sure that you are playing fundamentally sound strategies. You want to make sure that you are playing fundamentally sound first so that then whatever your opponent's doing isn't going to win much money off you at all, potentially, and usually they're just going to be losing. So make sure that you are understanding that you do not know your opponent's strategy, okay? You can guess about your opponent's strategy. You can make assumptions about your opponent's strategy, but you are never or rarely going to definitively know it, especially if you do not play with people on a regular basis. Um, let's talk about gambling lines, especially on things where some people have substantially more information than others. It's generally thought that for games that are full of public knowledge and stats, like um, baseball, right? That the lines that the sports book put out for baseball games are very, very close to accurate. And if they're not, they will be bet appropriately by the smart bettors very quickly to the point that they do become essentially the accurate line. Um, there's a website called Pinnacle Sports, and it's generally thought that whatever the break-even pinnacle line is, if you get rid of the, the rake, is the accurate line. And it's generally assumed that that is correct. So, what about games where there is a way smaller betting market or way way less public information? Good example of this, the Negreanu versus um, Doug Polk heads up match, right? There's a lot of unknown information here, a lot. So, you have to guess. But if you look at Twitter, there are people who seem to definitively know exactly what's going to happen, exactly how it's going to play out. And I always wonder what their thought process is, because clearly you can't know the future. You can guess at it, right? You can guess at it. But what happens is I think people assume that what they think is going to happen is the definitive truth. And that's just not true. It's just not the case, right? 
And it's especially interesting when you see people who have been very successful at betting, betting on both sides of something, right? And very often, you will see this in all betting markets or a lot of betting markets. Sometimes one side is like definitively the, let's call it sharp side, where the, the most of the smart bettors are betting, most of the winning bettors are betting. But quite often that's not the case. And um, it's important to recognize that when winning bettors are betting on both sides of a market, it implies either the market's efficient or some people are lacking information or they are assessing the information incorrectly, right? And that means that these people who are smart, who have dedicated themselves to studying and getting good at things like betting, still don't know everything. They're going to be wrong sometimes, right? And that's okay. It happens. The fun thing about betting as well is that if you're betting on, say, a five to one favorite, you can be right and still lose. That's what makes betting a whole lot of fun, a very, very engaging, is that you can make great plays and still lose, and you can make poor plays and still win, right? Um, this comes up very often if you're betting on a big underdog in something. Let's say there's a football game and there's a team that's a 10 to 1 underdog, meaning they're probably never going to win. Well, ne never. That's exactly it, right? People presume they're never going to win. Yet in reality, they're going to win, you know, call it 10% of the time for simplicity. But what if they actually win 15% of the time on average? And you can do your math, you can do the data, you can study the data, and you know that this team is going to win 15% of the time on average. It's actually a pretty decent edge. For every dollar you bet, you're going to get back, what, $1.50 on average. It's a big win rate. Now, you're going to have a lot of variance. You're going to have to go through many, many iterations of this occurrence in order to have variance even out. And you are usually going to lose your bet. You're usually going to lose your bet. In your mind, 85% of the time. And that is okay, right? Because you know that you are, well, you presume you're profitable. That's the neat thing, though. What if instead of winning, you know, 85% or 15% of the time, your team actually wins 7% of the time? Now, for every dollar you bet, you're only getting back 70 cents. So now you're losing 30 cents per bet, right? And that's um, pretty detrimental. So you need to make sure that you are doing your best to make intelligent plays, recognizing you don't know everything, okay? You need to make sure you fully recognize that you do not know everything because otherwise you're going to be making mistakes. Fortunately, poker, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how, depending on how you think about it, um, poker has a lot of data available, right? Um, last night, James Romero, I see you in the chat. Hello, James. James uh, did a webinar for the Poker Coaching Premium members where he provided lots of data on how you should be playing various scenarios and how people are actually playing various scenarios. And that is good to know, right? Very beneficial. And so instead of just guessing about various scenarios, you can instead have data. Kind of like baseball, right? Whenever you watch baseball, they have loads of data because things happen over and over and over again. And you know, while you may never be in a spot or rarely, well, while you will rarely be in a spot where you're getting check raised on the river, let's say, I don't know, two times per session or something, if you look at the way, if you look at lots of other people's hands and you get lots and lots of data, that may happen, I don't know, 10,000 times a day, right? So it happens to you two times per day, but it happens to everybody 10,000 times per day. You can see what hands people show up with, and then you can start to see where people are playing roughly the GTO strategy or way off from the GTO strategy. I mean, one of the exploits I talked about in my webinar yesterday, you can find that at youtube.com slash poker coaching, was you should be overfolding when your opponents apply immense aggression on the river. Why? Because people in general don't bluff the river often enough. Okay? So if they're not bluffing the river often enough, you in turn should overfold as a default, like right off, right out of the bat. Dylan said, you loved Romero's yesterday. Yes, you loved Romero's webinar yesterday. It was golden. Well, good. I'm glad you, glad you liked it. You clicked the like button. Well, good. Thank you. What is this weird shirt? This is my Halloween costume. I am Forky. Can you see Forky? Yeah. James is Buzz Lightyear. Thomas is Woody. He hates wearing Woody's clothes. Here's Woody's hat. No, I'm not feral. I am a Woody. Um... <laughs> And uh, mommy is an alien. Mommy gets 
I mean, look, I like the aliens. I thought the aliens were cool. Kids don't care about the aliens at all. They love Forky, though. I think that makes Amy sad because they always love Daddy infinitely and Mommy's like, eh, there she is. <laughs> Does it make sense to avoid slightly plus CV all-in scenarios against bad players in tournaments and go for better spots? It depends on if you think better spots are going to continue coming around in the future, right? Like, let's say someone's really bad, but someone else is likely to capture their stack before you, then if you have a reasonably profitable spot right now, you should probably take it. Now, if you're going to win, like, a penny by making the call, then probably not, right? But if you're going to win some decent amount, you probably should take that spot. The boys were all in here this morning. They've destroyed all of my stuff. Look at this shark. The shark has a literal coin in its mouth. Look at this. Come on, kids. <sighs> you wish I did the student hand reviews with this hat on. <laughs> does, does the hat go well with me? Maybe I'll wear Thomas's Woody costume here in just a second as well. It's so cute. It has like a fake, I guess it's cow skin jacket. And it's a yellow button-up shirt, and Thomas hates it. You're going to go play a couple day, a couple long sessions in a row. Any advice on playing longer sessions? Make sure your body is in decent shape. Drink water, eat healthy foods, get up, stretch, walk around, take breaks. You know, do your best to stay sane over the long period of time. Do you think these heads-up challenges are bad for poker? I think heads up challenges are good for poker if they're not overly malicious. I think the Negranu Polk one is overly malicious, so I actually don't think that's especially great for the game. Because um, whenever people get a little bit malicious, they start to just generally become nasty. And when you take people that are, you know, generally respected in the community and they start becoming nasty, like whether you like Negranu or Polk, like let's say you like Negranu, you don't like Polk. If Negranu starts being nasty, and you already don't like Polk, so you don't care about him. If Negranu starts being nasty, then you're like, oh, this guy I liked is now being nasty. So, like, it makes you perhaps like them a little bit less. But if you have something that's good-spirited, like um, the Phil Helmuth and uh, Antonio Smondiari show that Poker Go put on, I think that's great, right? That's two people having fun. Someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. But um, I don't think they're going to hate each other after the fact, right? Or before the fact, they were, you know, putting on a good show for the community. Why do you want to learn more? Why do I want to learn more? Because I'm trying to win money at poker. Turns out if you stop learning and everybody else keeps learning, you're going to get crushed. There is the, the logic, though, that maybe poker should be a little bit less like golf, where everybody is generally nice to each other. And a little bit more like professional wrestling that's full of drama and nonsense. And it's a tough thing. I'm not exactly sure what is optimal for the game. If you... Because, like, if, if you make poker a lot of nonsense, it's going to sound bad. It's going to sound very predatory. But if you take people who like nonsense... You're not going to like this, but usually they're idiots, okay? Usually they like irrelevant things they like to gamble they like to try to stroke each other well they like to stroke their own ego right they want to prove they're the best because what else would you want to do with your life and i'm not saying that's even bad but like in reality those are the people you want to play poker against because they're not going to be very good right in general some of them can be good some of them are probably not going to be good but people who are out there to stroke their own egos and, I mean, it kind of goes back with the, the topic of the show today. They think they know everything. They want to see action and excitement. People who like that kind of thing usually don't have great emotional control, usually want to experience playing instead of studying. And uh, that, that could be good for poker. Because you get more fish in the game, right? You want more fish in the game? Maybe maybe we do want more fish in the game. <laughs> right? So I think that's that certainly could be reasonable. Let's see. 
Being nice in online poker is hard. Eh, don't worry about that. Can I help you crush 30 person on demand tournaments? Those are basically like regular sit and goes. The truth hurts indeed. How's Buzz? Buzz is fine. James uh, decided to kiss a concrete elephant going at about 15 miles an hour the other day. So his tooth went through his face. <laughs> um, basically, his tooth went through his lip. So he had to get stitches on his lip. He looks like a zombie on his lips. Um, he has to go to the dentist, I think, on Monday. They're going to check it out to see if there's any damage to his teeth. I don't think there are, but he'll be fine. Do we have sit and go content on poker coaching? A little bit. We actually do not recommend you spend a ton of time playing sit and goes. The same reason we don't recommend you spend a ton of time playing most games besides No Limit Hold'em, because you can't really win a ton of money at sit and goes today unless you're like one of the top 20 sit and go players in the world. And the reason is because the games just don't run very often, right? And the games that do run currently usually provide an incredibly low ROI. Like right here, do you recommend spin and goes? Like not really. Because rake is kind of high for the games. Uh, the games are super turbo-y. And I'm, I'm, I'm very confident that you could win at, or people do win at spin and goes. I know some people who do. But would I recommend that for a good way for people to get good at poker and succeed long term? I don't think so. I would generally recommend people funnel their attention towards either multi-table tournaments or no limit hold'em cash games. Because I know pretty high degree of certainty. Those games are going to be around for a long time. Whereas I'm not convinced, like, Spin and Go is going to be around all that long. I'm not convinced, um, Sit and Go, I mean, Sit and Go has been dead for forever. I'm not, I'm not convinced, like, um, Limit Hold'em is going to be around for forever. I mean, it's basically dead too, right? I mean, I, I transitioned from Limit Hold'em a long time ago. I transitioned from Sit and Go's a long time ago, right? Because the games became roughly break even for everybody. Everyone was playing to try to get rake back, which is fine if the site gives you rake back. Uh, but you remember what happened at Poker Stars, right? Everyone was getting their $200,000 a year in rake back, and then they just shut it off. What happens then? Well, now we're just all losing money because the winners were winning at 1% ROI. Everybody else was losing at like 3, 3 4, 5% ROI to getting 200K back at the end of the year to make them, you know, plus 100K profit or whatever. And that's fine if that's the deal I have with the site, but those deals don't always last. So I, I generally recommend you don't study games that provide a very low win rate. Um, games that provide a very low win rate, this is gonna be things like high stakes satellites, double or nothing sit and goes, spin and goes, sit and goes. All of these games require a very simple strategy to succeed. It's what it amounts to. And when you play a simple game, you're just not going to have a high potential win rate. And why do I want all of you to spend your time learning a game that's going to provide you a relatively low win rate. Doesn't make sense, right? Now, to be fair, I do think sit and goes are a reasonable practice for um, multi-table tournaments, for final tables, right? I'm very convinced that I would have done way worse in multi-table tournaments if I did not play a lot of sit and goes back in the day. I mean, look back here, look at all these trophies, right? All these trophies and bracelets and whatnot come from winning poker tournaments. I mean, look, there's even more up here, right? You see all these? All this stuff comes from winning poker tournaments and getting good at final tables. So I'm not going to say that you should not play them, but I would say that it's not the game you want to be spending all of your time on. That's generally what I would say. Do you have any interest in watching the Polka Negreanu match? Not really. I'll probably record a content over a few hands or something for YouTube, but like that that's not... I, I don't have a lot of free time to begin with. Um, it takes all of my free time to watch the poker coaching content that the coaches put out where I'm actually definitively learning things, right? Yesterday, we had three webinars by the Poker Coaching Coaches. They were all great. The day before that, we had a, an amazing webinar featuring Michael Acevedo, who wrote the book Modern Poker Theory, and Giraffe Ganger, Bert Stevens. He um, won the $10,000 buy-in tournament on full tilt. Uh, not full tilt. <laughs> Sometimes reminds me of full tilt. Uh, GG. <laughs> um, he, he won the 10K on GG the other day for 400000 bucks. So they went through and they reviewed his hand history, like the big spots using the solver, discussing why you should deviate from the solver, etc. So we had two of the absolute brightest minds in poker reviewing a $10,000 buy and win. It was great. I learned a lot from it. If you're a Poker Coaching Premium member, check it out. It's right there in the classes tab. If you want to sign up for Poker Coaching, by the way, check out pokercoaching.com slash Halloween. We have lots of great discounts there for you. I would highly recommend anyone who wants to play poker at all 
at a medium or a high level, check out Poker Coaching Premium. If you sign up for a year membership, it costs you about $2 per day. If you're not going to spend $2 per day getting good at poker, well, you probably don't care all that much about poker. Manny says he saw the 10K review. It was very good. It was very good. I loved it. We're going to be doing more of those. I'm going to be doing one with Matt Affleck next week. Um, we, talking, we were talking to Faraz Jock on his stream. Um, he said that he would probably like to have reviews from Acevedo as well. You may not know this, but Acevedo is the man. You want to get good at poker. Talk to Michael Acevedo. I'm terrible at cash games, but which tournaments would I recommend instead of sit and goes? Just multi-table tournaments. That said, understand there is a big difference in those games. So a big mistake I made when I first started playing multi-table tournaments is I played pretty tight in tournaments because in sit and goes, it's often fine to play kind of tight because in sit and goes, the goal is to you know get in the top 30% of the field, get in the money, right? It's not all that hard to get in the money if you just play kind of tight. Now, in tournaments, the goal is to get in the top, like, 2% of the field. That's pretty hard to do if you play tight. So, instead, you have to play a substantially different strategy. Nice hat. Oh, I still have this hat on. Yeah, this is, this is Thomas's Woody hat. He hates it. Isn't this cute? What a smart idea, right? This helps the hat stay on babies' heads. Good design, right? I was shocked at how well these things were designed, given it's a cheap-ish Halloween costume for children. And I have my Forky shirt on. I'll be wearing my Forky shirt tomorrow. <sighs> Let's see. How do you deal with yourself when you make mistakes and you cannot tolerate yourself? <laughs> I mean, look, understand that sometimes you're going to mess up, right? That said, uh, whenever I make a mistake, I usually write down what I'm doing wrong. Forget about it. I'm in the poker session, at least. I forget about it. And then I address it later. Some things are easy to fix in real time, like, say, you're timing out and you're in the process of loading up more tables, well, either you're distracted or you're playing too many tables or whatnot. But if you see yourself screwing up left and right, ask yourself, why am I screwing up left and right? That is heavily valuable information. And if you can figure out why you're screwing up, then you can figure out what you can do to stop screwing up, and uh, then you can move forward productively. You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta do it. Also, if you're a Poker Coaching member, make sure you join the study session. That's happening right after this show at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Um, check out the Poker Coaching Discord. Go to PokerCoaching.com, click on the Community tab, get in the Discord, and it'll be right there. During the first year of tournaments where you lost big, were you depressed? Eh, no. Did I start to doubt myself? Well, I knew already I wasn't good at tournaments because I'd never played tournaments, right? Here we go, Jamie. This is an important point. I'm going back to the topic of today, you don't know everything. I already knew when I started playing multi-table tournaments that that was a different game than sit and goes. Just like cash games are a different game than tournaments and... PLO is a different game than No Limit Hold'em, right? And I recognize right off the bat, I'm playing a game I don't know nearly as well as I know Sit and Goes, because I was very, very good at Sit and Goes back in the day. And I had almost no tournament experience. Um, so I realized I was playing a game that I was somewhat unfamiliar with. I'd probably played, I don't know, 500 tournaments or something online. Basically, I would just play on Sundays every once in a while. And um, I knew I wasn't great at them. But I was learning, right? So did I start to doubt myself? I never had confidence in the idea that I was a good winning sit and go player. I wasn't delusional right off the bat. So many people, especially in gambling, it seems, get good at one thing and think that they are going to be good at something else. You see this in sports betting all the time, right? Somebody becomes like a good baseball better, let's say. And now they assume, all right, baseball's over. Football season's starting. I'm going to bet on football now. Then they just get crushed. Why? Because they're different games, right? <laughs> Poker, great example. Long time ago, PLO came onto the scene, and a lot of No Limit Hold'em players thought, okay, I'm just going to jump right into PLO. And they got crushed. Some of them went broke. I know two people who went broke. They were good No Limit Hold'em players, and they lost literally all their money playing a game they didn't know how to play. Why'd they go broke? Because they were overconfident and... What, dumb? Is dumb the right word? Understand, when you play different things, it doesn't matter. Some people who are good at poker think they're automatically going to be good at things like um, cryptocurrency betting, right? Or politics. You see this on Twitter all the time. Just because you're good at one thing does not mean that your thoughts are the least bit relevant to other things. Now, to be fair, you can get good at multiple things, right? Nothing to say you can't get good at um, cryptocurrencies if you're a poker player. I mean, look, we have literal books right back here. Where are these things? Did I lose it already? Come on, we were going to make a point. Where'd it go? 
mastering Bitcoin and mastering Ethereum back there somewhere. And um, you can still study and try to get good at things. That said, recognize that you probably don't know what you're doing when you're first starting. And many people have invested substantially more time than you at other things. So did I doubt myself? No, because I knew what I signed up for. What are just decent win rates at 1, 3, and 2, 5? You can win at something like 10 big blinds per hour. I think that's a good, solid win rate. You can probably win a little bit more. When I played 1, 3 at Borgata, it wasn't a big sample. It was only like a week. You know, grinded kind of hard for a week. I won at like, what was it, 40 bucks per hour? Or it was $35 an hour at 1, 2. So like 18 big blinds per 100, but I probably ran a little bit hot. If you split players into three groups, good, average, and fish, what would you say their tournament win rates would be? I don't know. I, like these numbers, this, this is not how poker works because they're like the elite players who are actually winning a pretty good amount. They're the small winning regs who are winning like some small amount. There's like small losing regs who are losing a little bit and then just like the super fish who are losing a lot. And our coaches play one cent, two cent unedited. Like every fold raise everything. I mean, I've I've played not one cent, two cent, but I've played some higher stakes games. I mean, I would be happy to make that. Sure, why not? I'll do it. Let's see. Make make tiny live footage game. I actually have to quarantine because I'm gonna go to Vegas coming up soon. Can't tell you all why, it's a secret. It's gonna be fun though. Going to Vegas in a few weeks. I'm going to have to come home in quarantine. So I'll be stuck at home, away from the family. And um, I'll have plenty of time to grind out some some content like that. So yeah, I'll do that. Should you play a wider range? Okay, so when you play a cash game and your opponents are playing nitty, should you play a wider range? You should play a wider range aggressively to try to run them over. Got the hiccups. But if they want to apply aggression back at you, you should play very, very tightly. PPP has a game called Crazy Pineapple. That's not um, that's not a it's not a new game. It's an old game, old antiquated game. Let's see what content do I recommend to start on tournament play? If you're new to Poker Coaching Premium, go through the 30 day tournament preparation challenge. Go through all of that. That is a very very good starting point. What was the key factor for me going from losing to winning tournaments? Talking to good poker players who are good at poker. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. So I did a lot of talking back in the day with Dave Benefield. If you all may know him, his name's Raptor. He he won all the money at poker, retired, played the main event one more time, final table it, why not? Um, I talked a lot of poker with him, and I talked a lot of poker with Tom Dwan. And basically, they taught me to loosen up, right? Loosening up, getting out of your comfort zone, playing much more high variance poker turns out is the play especially in games where you have to get in the top one percent of the field to make any money or to make good money can you grind for a living wait do you, do you think it would still be as feasible for you to grind for a living today compared to back in the day i mean now i have a wife and two kids which makes things substantially more difficult right if i had i mean look it's nice to know that if i had nothing else going on in life yeah i could sit in my office all day and grind eight hours a day and make plenty of money sure I would have no no problems. I mean, I grind on Sundays and make plenty of money. And we can do the same thing the other days. So, um, yeah. What are your thoughts on 2021 World Series Poker Live? I would actually bet against it happening live. Any tips for playing for a living while in college? <laughs> do you want to get through college? I ended up quitting college because I'm um, winning too much money. Do you think all the pros should know their ROI? You're, you're very rarely going to know your specific ROI in any individual tournament. You can know your ROI across the board. But like That kind of thing will help you decide which games you should play, how much bankroll you need, etc. But it's all just an estimation to some extent. Because very rarely you're going to have a gigantic sample of tournaments. But I mean, if you're playing like pretty hard courses, let's say you play, I don't know, 30 tournaments a day. You'll get in 200 tournaments a week. It's 800 a month. Call it 1,000 a, a year. No, I'm sorry, 10,000 a year. You can probably know your ROI after a year, within reason. I mean, but even then, it's still just going to be heavily skewed by outliers. JL's direct approach truly got you in the right direction. Well, that's the goal. We are not here to discuss nonsense. You probably won't find me as a WWE wrestler anytime soon. 
But like we all said, maybe that's what poker needs. We need people who are being nonsensical so we can crush them. You make 14 big blinds per 100 in the small stakes games. You're wondering if it's acceptable. Or I wonder if, it's a, if it is sustainable. Um, you, you maybe run a little. I mean, I don't know. Keep playing. 150 hours is nothing, right? I would tell you to keep playing. Get 1,000 hours and see what you're looking at. And after 1,000 hours, you'll probably know. But you're going to have downswings. You're going to have upswings, right? You're a fan of BCB. Funny how you two disagree with each other. He says you should pass on marginal spots. I don't know why you thought I said you should not pass on marginal spots. But you should often pass on marginal spots, right? You should pass on marginal spots when there are going to be better spots in the future that you can very likely collect, right? You also want to pass on marginal spots when it's for all of your money. You want to pass on marginal spots when a lot of your bankroll is at risk, et cetera, et cetera, right? If you're playing cash games with a giant bankroll, you should not pass on marginal spots at all. So I have no clue what you're referring to here. I know Ben CB is not a nit, so I'm not sure what you're referring to. You had your greatest comeback on Sunday. You had 87 chips, and you final tabled. Good job, good work. Do you always fold crap cards? Um, no. I have a hand from Weekly Poker Hand uh, where, I, where I run a triple... Uh, I was going to run a triple barrel bluff. I only had to double barrel it. But I was going to uh, triple barrel bluff the 9-3 offsuit. What would your WWE name be? I don't know. I don't even know what WWE characters are named anymore. But um, type it in. What would my WWE name be? Give it to me. Maybe we'll use it. What's typical ROI in small stakes tournaments to let you know you should move up? Oh, gosh, this is always a tough thing to say. Um, I don't know, 70, 60, 70, 80%, somewhere in there. If you're winning at 80% ROI in tournaments, you're going to be probably pretty good. What do I think about Charlie Carroll who says, don't play GTO in the micro stakes. You should not attempt to play GTO in almost any stakes. You should exploit whatever your opponents do wrong. That's just good poker. You make money when you take advantage of your opponent's mistakes. That said... You should have some idea of what fundamentally sound poker looks like because that way you know where you should be adjusting from and where you should be adjusting back to if you're just clueless about that. Especially as you move up, especially as you play against better players, you're going to get demolished. How do you reconcile the fact that the coaching business makes people get better? First things first. This may sound overly confident, but I would be happy to play poker with all of you. <laughs> um, look, I realize I have made some very good poker players or at least helped make some very good poker players. Uh, there were two players who were actually in the top 10 of the GPI not too long ago. Top 10 tournament players in the world. Two young guys from Europe. They both told me they started learning from me back when they were about 12 years old at my first training site. <laughs> Which cool you know and then um you know they, they thank me for the work and they say they say they love my work back then and you know since then they become like world-class tournament players but so certainly some people have gotten decent right off the bat for me and you know I've, i'm talking to lots of people today who learn, love the training site i mean there's lots of i don't know top 300 poker players who are on the training site participating studying and the game will get tougher but at the same time it's like you know whatever they can play with me. It's fine. To be fair, the way poker works to some extent is people win at the small stakes, they move up to the higher stakes, and they lose. They move back down, they win more money from the people there, they, they, they lose. They move up, they lose. They move up, they lose. They move up, they lose. Eventually, they're going to break through and slowly, slowly move up. But in general, most people play a little bit too high for them. Why? People like pushing the boundaries. They like trying to stroke their ego. They like trying to win more money. Etc. 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 And I think I'm pretty good at game selection to the point that I'm playing almost entirely games that I can beat. I try to not play games based on ego problems. And I recognize that the games get tougher over time. All games get tougher over time. Like look at um running. Right? People used to run slower than they run today. Why? Because people got better at it. They studied. And they they used analytics and tools to get better just like in poker right you use tools and analytics to get better so poker is always getting tougher but i am surrounding myself by people who i think are better than me if you look at pokercoaching.com i'm not the best poker player there in terms of the coaches right i fully recognize this i hire people i want to learn from and then i share it with all of you and um in reality let's say i am a good competent ten thousand dollar buying tournament player with a reasonable win rate there let's just pretend 
would I be happy playing with $1,000 tournament players trying to move up? The answer is yes. Now, I would recommend that those players not come up and play with the $10,000 players because they're going to lose, right? So I'm happy to tell you all that. I'm happy to take a little bit of money out of my pocket to help you all specifically who want to support me and the other coaches at Poker Coaching and my employees. But um, I've definitely made the small and medium stakes substantially harder. And I don't really care. <laughs> I don't really care because I don't, I mean, yeah, small and medium stakes get tougher. That's fine. And uh, those players can come play the high stakes and they're welcome to come play the high stakes. <sighs> All right. And if there ever comes some time where I realize I cannot beat the games that I am playing, I'll just move down. But like, I mean, I'm playing reasonably high tournaments online with a solid win rate across the board over a pretty decent sample. And uh, I mean, if I'm still winning, I don't, I don't really see a problem with this. Maybe I could be winning slightly more. That said, there's a lot of value just getting people into games, getting the games running and going. And um, that's very valuable. That said, I would recommend all of you, don't have ego problems, don't play too high, because you'll get crushed. Remember, all you gotta do to win at poker, play in games, find game, find a game you can beat, play it a lot. That's it. Find a game you can beat, play it a lot. And keep a proper bankroll. Find a game you can beat, play it a ton, keep a proper bankroll. When you play too high, you're not keeping a proper bankroll sometimes. You're also not playing in games you can beat. If you break any of these rules, you're gonna have a tough time winning at poker long term. What are my thoughts on this, thoughts on the staking tool on GG? Uh, I think it's good. I, I don't think they take any rake, right? If they don't take any rake, then it's just great. And I'm pretty sure they don't take rake. It's also nice because they'll show you the actual results of the players on the site, which is pretty good. Now, obviously, some people can run super hot on the site and like look better than they are, and some people are gonna run super bad and look worse than they are. Um. Maybe that allows you to get good buys, though. Like, if you know someone who's a good tournament player, they're up infinite money on all the other sites, yet they're down a little bit over a small sample on GG, then um, maybe they're good buys. We see other people who have, like, they're, like, up infinite on GG, but, you know, up, only up a little bit on the other sites. Maybe they're not good buys, depending on whatever markup they set. But no, I think it's good. There's probably a lot of money to be made there. Maybe I should look into that. <laughs> I don't know. Anybody making money staking on GG? It's probably of some value. Do you play only tournaments these days? Um, maybe going to Vegas to play a cash game. We'll see. It's been mostly tournaments just because of the way my life's set up recently. But no, I'm happy to play cash games. I used to play a ton of cash games. Now, though, you don't really play tournaments for... I mean, so now... What am I trying to say? I'm sorry. I'm reading the chat. Essentially, what happens is now in tournaments, you can re-enter a lot, right? What I used to do back in the day is I would go to a tournament series and I would play the tournament at noon whenever it started... And then I, whenever I busted, if I busted before 6, 7, 8 p.m., I would play cash games until about midnight. But now you can re-enter until about um, 7, 8, 9 p.m., right? So you're usually in the tournament until 7, 8, 9, 10 p.m., right? So there's really no time to play cash games if you don't want to dedicate time to playing cash games, right? So if that's the case, then I don't really have time to dedicate to that. And I think my win rate is probably higher in the tournaments. And it's like a little bit easier, I think, life balance when you're dedicating yourself to playing one thing at a time. So I haven't really played a ton of cash games. That's what it amounts to. You staked Fedor and won a thousand bucks. Good job. You know what? Oh my gosh, this is gonna. I don't even know if I should tell you all this. It's such a disaster. A while back, Fedor was looking for someone to back him in um, high stakes tournaments online. He posted, I want to find someone to buy all my action. Let's go. I couldn't afford all of his action, so I was talking to a few of my friends. Um, I have a group chat with very, very good poker players, world class poker players, and one of them who plays against Fedor all the time, one of the best American poker players, maybe the best American poker player, he said he thought the markup was a little bit too high. Asked Fedor if he'd move on the markup. He said no. So he passed. Fedor then proceeds to win all the money. <laughs> Fedor then proceeds to win all the money. So that was annoying. All right, all right. I have to get going. I'm going to go put the finishing touches on recording the audiobook of Excelling at Tough No Limit Holding Games. Uh, here it is. Whenever you read an audiobook, you have to read it perfectly. If you mess up anything, you have to redo it. I messed up about 15 times reading this 400-page book. 
So now I have to get up and I have to go across New York City to a sound studio to record 15 mistakes, which is going to take me like 15 minutes. But that's what I do for all of you. Let me tell you something Thomas says. It's very funny. He comes in my room. You see his book is all bent up now because he comes in here and messes with it. He says, look, daddy, daddy. And he's so proud. And then he says this. He says, look, mommy, mommy. He thinks Alex Carr, right here, this guy. He thinks Alex Carr is his mommy. <laughs> I haven't told Alex Carr that. I should tell him. That'll be funny. Anyway, check this out. JLPoker.com slash tough. Good, solid book. Shout out to Ken Kep, who won, who cashed $500 this week playing in small stakes. Good job, Ken. He's been involved in the study sessions. You got the old knit to go after it. Good job. Good work, Louis Philippe. You know, we need, Louis Philippe, you want to be a coach on poker coaching? We got to figure out how to get you involved with this. this. This could be good. It seems like you're doing a great job with the community. I don't know. Send us an email. Well, tell me what you want to do. We'll make it work. You're doing a great job at the site, and we appreciate it. All right. Bluff says, Trump or Biden? Well, clearly, whoever the betting market is favored is almost certainly likely to win, right? In all betting betting markets, right? If you take baseball team A and they're a three to one favorite and you have asked which one's likely to win, probably the three to one favorite. I have to go now. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of your experience. What's today, Friday? Is it Friday already? Ugh, week's already over. I have so much more to do. I've been recording my tournament, um, my, my tournament course, and oh my gosh, it's so long. I'm almost through the flop section. It's so exciting. I always love when people say, but underdogs win sometimes. Of course they do. We discussed that right at the top of the show. Did you not hear how I recently made a bet on an underdog? Because um, I think it's a good value. That doesn't mean they're likely to win, right? I mean, I'll briefly talk to you about the Negranu bet. So, I mean, Negranu is playing Polk heads up. I got Negranu at a five to one bet, or one to five bet. So, you know, I was, I was getting good odds. Needed him to win 18% of the time. I think he's going to win like 25 to 33% of the time, somewhere in there. So, if you pose the question, do I think he's going to lose? The answer is yes. Because I think he's going to lose, you know, 20, I don't think he's going to win 25 to 33% of the time. I still think it's a good bet though, right? So you can, I can think something's going to lose and think it's a good bet, right? Very, very important to realize that you can think something is going to lose and still think it is a good bet. And if you have any logical problems understanding this, realize betting's probably not for you because often in gambling games, you're betting on things that are going to lose most of the time. Like when you're drawing to a gut shot straight draw in poker, right? You're getting good pot odds. You expect to get paid off if you get there. Your opponent bets small, doesn't cost you a whole lot. You're putting in a little bit to try to win a ton, right? You have good implied odds. Kind of like when you're betting on a big underdog, you often, you often get paid off substantially more than you bet. And um, that's important to recognize, right? Someone can be likely to lose, but still be a good bet. Just because it's likely to lose doesn't mean they lose every time. I think a lot of people really have a problem with that idea, especially a lot of um, non-gamblers. Like gamblers realize that, you know, your flush draw comes in 20% of the time on the river or whatever it is, right? It just always does. <laughs> always comes in 20%. Whereas a lot of people realize 20%, oh, that never happens. That's 0%. And 20% is not 0%. 20% is 20%. So make sure you realize that those things are very, very different. And also 99% is not 100%. 99 is not 100, 99 is 99. And every once in a while, that 1% comes in, which is a lot of fun, right? And the neat thing is that when that 1% comes in, all the people who bet on that 1% say, look, I told you so, look how smart I am. But in reality, maybe that one in 99 actually comes in one in a thousand. Maybe it comes in one out of 50. Who knows? Who knows? Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. Make the most of your time. Again, check out pokercoaching.com slash Halloween if you want to substantially up your poker skills. I've been learning a ton from the other coaches at the site, so make sure you do that. Check it out. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Have a great weekend. Click the like button. Easy click the like button. Just click, click, click the like button. I'll talk to you later.